Hello friends and gamers and welcome to the fortress. My name is Jinx and this is our second episode of the campaign award medal system for Global War 1936 for the Spring Offensive Tournament. Now, I'm a co-creator with this with Panzer King and it's been a, a pretty fantastic working relationship. So I've done more of the software and the kind of the design and the legwork behind um, how everything works under the hood and he's been kind of the hardware guy pulling pieces together, arranging them, uh, grabbing hold of the metals and that kind of thing. So it's worked really quite well. So I'm publicizing this stuff in order to get constructive criticism from the community because I believe, you know, um, more uh, the more brains we can incorporate in this, the better off it will be. So feedback from the community is very much appreciated as long as it's not insulting or demeaning because I want, to the best of my ability, to get endorsement from the public as much as possible to design the best kind of tournament structure that we possibly can to make this uh, award system something really unique and that would stand out quite a bit. So that's my thinking behind it. Let's get started. So the campaign ribbon bar system is set up in such a way that you'll have three ribbons attached to your chest. One of them will be the campaign ribbon, which will be a unique ribbon for each tournament. It'll have a number attachment that will count the annual tournaments. The number attachment will begin at one in 2021 and will count up from there. The prestige ribbon shows how many prestigious accomplishments the player achieved within the game by attaching prestige stars. So with one star, it's fairly a basic accomplishment. Two stars is going above your duty. Three stars is exceptional work, and four stars is a rare and astounding achievement. I want the fourth star tier. If somebody has four stars on their prestige ribbon, you know you're sitting against somebody that's either extraordinarily lucky or extraordinarily good in playing the game. The national ribbon simply shows which nation was played by the recipient. It may have a gold or silver star attachment, depending if the nation won first, second, or third place. Third place meaning that it would be blank and not have any star. It may further have an oak leaf attachment to symbolize how many major powers were played by the recipient. So, for instance, if you're playing as the let's see, as, if you're playing as the USA, so you'd start off with a bronze star because you're playing as the major power France and the major power USA. Now, if KMT evolved to become a major power, then you guess silver, uh, silver oak leaf up there as well to symbolize your achievements in that front. And if further you're playing all the allies, say if your other allied team member came in sick and couldn't show up to the tournament, you'd get gold because you'd be playing with four major powers. You'd be playing the evolved KMT, the USA, France, as well as the Allies. Uh, sorry, as well as the Commonwealth, rather. That would be the best way of saying it. Okay, so that's the way it's set up. So again, I'm looking for criticism for the rest of this. Constructive criticism, of course. The rest of it deals with this prestige ribbon. So the maximum stars you can get, maximum prestige stars you can get is four. It's separated into a way that you're going to get certain things within a tier. So there'll be three options to get a tier one star, three options for a tier two star, etc. You, If you happen to somehow be very unlucky and miss your second star and get a three star tier, you won't get automatically get your second star. Your ribbon will only have two stars on it because you want to, you could only get score one thing out of each of those categories that will build up on your prestige ribbon. I thought I'd put that out there for you guys to know. If you happen to get a four star, but you haven't got your first star, well, you only have three stars, you know, uh, or whatever else, in the, whatever other tiers you scored as well. You get the idea. So I'm going to go through these tiers as well, give you guys my quick thoughts on the subject, and hopefully give me an idea if it's balanced or not. All right, let's get started. So in tier one, first option, we have the happy time. Gain a prestige star if at any point during the game, Germany raided any number of enemy convoy lines in a single game turn and caused the loss of at least eight enemy IPPs. Now, eight, is eight the right balance is the question for this one. On the map we have here, we have five for the West Atlantic line. We have six for the East Atlantic line. And in the Mediterranean line, we have a few more. We have another six down south. We have three, etc. So I think it's doable to get eight in a single turn. You'll have to have a few subs spread around, but it's doable to take out eight in a single turn. I know I've had it done against me. Atlantic Wall. Gain a prestige star if at any point during the game, Germany controls a coast artillery in each of the territories of Aquitaine, Normandy, Picardy, Belgium, and the Netherlands. When I wrote this up initially, I actually didn't have Netherlands on there, uh, as well as possibly Aquitaine. But um, in consultation with Panzer King, he suggested to add them on there as well, even though it forces Germany to go after the Netherlands and build a coastal artillery there. And I guess I, it makes sense to me. It makes sense because it nudges the person down the historical pathway, but that's up for debate as well. Now those territories, as you see here, is Aquitaine, Normandy, Picardy, Belgium, Netherlands. So the debate is, the question I would have here, is it worthwhile taking out the Netherlands as an option? 
Now we also have Denmark up there, which was kind of fortified as well in World War II, but we left that one out as a deliberate choice, not to force the player overly much. Next up we have the Turkish procurement. Now the idea here is I don't want to force the players too much to go down the historical pathway. I want there to always be an escape hatch. In this first one here, the happy time, we have the Germans are going out after the Allies because they have all the convoy routes. In the second one here, they're definitely going after the Allies because France has that Atlantic Wall. You need those territories to build the Atlantic Wall. The one down here, all territory of the Turkish printed roundel is controlled by Germany or a member of its alliance. So even if the Italians grab it, you still get your tier one. And that way it doesn't force the German player to go after, it doesn't force the German player to go after the Allies all the time. And that's the idea there an out for a person to play a little bit with alt history. All right, in tier two, you can score one from this category. Operation Ida. Gain a prestige star if at any point during the game, one German army unit and one vehicle class unit is present in Eastern Egypt. So where's Eastern Egypt? Eastern Egypt is right here, Cairo Suez. That's to represent Rommel's push in North Africa. Now I'm not saying that Germany has to capture that territory. It, it's up to the Italians to see what they want to do in this case, but they have to have a mechanized, or sorry, a vehicle class unit, as well as an armor class unit present here to achieve that award. Now, this could be very difficult to do, but it could also be very easy. If you're playing with the, what's it called, the Deutsches Afrika Corps expansion, it's not that hard. You essentially just lend lease a unit across the Mediterranean. Pretty easy to do. If you're not playing with that, it can get kind of difficult. You either have to get the Italians to carry you across, or you capture Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia here, build with a shipyard, build yourself a transport, protect that transport and ship your units across. So that is also an option. Now, next up we have Operation Fire Magic. Now, that's a cool name. Gain a prestige star if at any point during the game, Germany controls the Soviet city Leningrad for a full game round from the end of the German turn to the end of the following German turn. So that one's pretty obvious, I don't really need to point it out here, but Leningrad here. Now this is not what historically happened, Leningrad survived uh, until the end of the end of the war, it never capitulated to Axis hands, so that's the idea there. It's going to be interesting. So that's the option, tier 2. Lastly, War Plan Z. Now again, I want this to be an alternate history escape hatch where you're not forced to follow the historical pathway. You see Operation Ida goes after the Allies, Operation Fire Magic after the common turn, but War Plan Z is kind of the middle of the road path that is not overly aggressive towards anybody. You need to build, or Germany needs to control at any point during the game, not at all points in the game, but at a single point during the game, two battleships, one aircraft carrier, two heavy cruisers, four destroyers, and six submarines. Whether they build them or capture them from the French, it doesn't really matter, but they have to have all this. This one works well with um, War Plan Z expansion, which I quite like. I wish I want to play that game sometime, or that expansion sometime. The issue with playing that expansion is, of course, then you signal what you're going to do to your allies, right? So the, a person actually has to play that expansion almost every single game and sometimes opt into it, sometimes opt out. Anyways, so it works well because regardless, you still have to build your aircraft carrier, which, if memory serves, is a good 15, if not 20 IPP, somewhere there. It's up there. Maybe it's as much as 666. Uh, it might be 18. I'm not too sure, though. So that's what the tier three is. My only question is, when a person looks at this, they'll say Operation Ida is difficult and time consuming. Operation Fire Magic, though, might be a pain in the butt. Like that'll be a lot of dice rolls and a lot of maneuvering to get it, but somebody might just simply give up on Operation Ida and go after Operation Fire Magic, which is historical, right? You know, to go after the one <laughs> Operation Fire Magic was more of a priority. Okay, moving on to our tier threes. So Operation Heron, gain a bronze star if at any point during the game, Germany controls the Soviet city Stalingrad for a full game round, from the end of the German turn to the end of the following German turn. Now, I want to point out that the Russians have their own little objective where it's hold on to four city territories for the entire length of the game. Now, the Russians, they have Novosibirsk over here. Uh, let me just get this linked up. Novosibirsk, wrong color. Novosibirsk. So that's one Stalingrad, two. Uh, three and four for Leningrad. So they have to hold on to four territories at the end of every Soviet turn. Now, theoretically, they could pick up, you know, Peking if they wanted to, they could pick up Istanbul if they wanted to, Rome, perhaps Warsaw, perhaps Madrid if they're lucky, and, you know, the Republicans win that fight. So it does work, and it could work to do it this way. 
But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this is going to be interesting, I think, this feature right here. So the Germans are, are they're going to be incentivized to go this direction towards Stalingrad, which is historical as well. Okay, Operation Sea Line. Now this one will be quite a challenge. Oh, yeah, quite a challenge, I think. If, if, uh, if the Allied player plays it right, there should almost never be an Operation Sea Line, I would say. You know, if So, same thing if the Germany controls the British city London for a full game round, from the end of the German turn to the end of the following German turn. So both of those are interesting, interesting options. Military administration of France. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, Germany or a member of its alliance control all or most of the following territories. Two of the territories included below can be omitted from the objective. All French home country, all German home country. So German home country is their territories here, apart from East Prussia. East Prussia is not part of German home country. It'll be these territories right here. And, of course, French home country is everything surrounding Paris right here. So they need to hold all that except for two territories. So if, if it means on the last turn of the game, the British or the Allies, the Americans, they come in and recapture Normandy and they recapture Picardy, well, you're still good. You're still kind of in control of all those areas. So that's the idea there. There's not going to be any last minute sniping on the very last turn where this thing occurs. All right, so that takes care of tier three. A little bit more difficult by far, but if a person succeeds in any one of these, I would consider them to have achieved a very good victory at that point. You know, realistically, to prevent Operation Sea Line, all a person has to do is build a coastal artillery here, which, to my great shame, in Operation Winter Solace, I did not see that. I thought I had time because I didn't see where the, those Marines, I thought they were here, when in fact they were here. So I got sniped. Tier four, Lebensraum. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, Germany or a member of its alliance control all or most of the following territories. Five of the territories included below can be omitted from the objective. All territory with the German printed around all, Polish printed around all, Alsace, Lorraine, Picardy, Belgium, Netherlands, Austria, Bohemia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, all territory with the USSR printed around all west of the Ural Mountains, Kazakhstan, and Caspian Sea. This includes etc. etc. I'll show you where that is on the map. So that's basically saying, hold on, the French territory, Alsace, Lorraine, Picardy. So basically, when the Germans came in, they didn't intend to keep all of France, as far as I know. I could be wrong in my history, but they didn't intend on keeping all of France. I think Alsace-Lorraine was pretty much all they wanted to do, whereas the rest of it, they were just holding on to until the end of the war. And then theoretically, they would have returned it. Was was the theory. Who knows if they would have done anything there. But in this history, because we're not playing that an evil ideology, we're playing a, a more noble faction. So the idea there is you just basically annex Picardy and Alsace-Lorraine. You'd hold on to Belgium and Netherlands. Let's see what else there was. Belgium, Netherlands. Is Denmark on there? I don't see Denmark. Okay, Denmark is not on there. Austria, Bohemia. So you have Austria, Bohemia. You have all of Poland. You have these three territories. And Russia is a big loser in this one. Because Russia would lose everything up to basically this line. Yeah, this line. So it includes all these territories uh, west of the Ural Mountains and west of this river here. So that means Stalingrad, basically all these valuable territories. The only one worth anything here at this point is Ural, Ural territory over here and everything to the east, Novosibirsk and everything in the far east. So that's a tier four strong accomplishment. Like you're basically winning the game at that point when you hold that much territories. Now, of course, the exception is five of the territories below can be omitted. So you can omit you know, the Netherlands, Belgium, Picardy, and Alsace-Lorraine. You could do that. Even Austria, you could do that as well. But you also want to have a little bit of a buffer space where on the last turn, the Soviets don't come in and take out this territory or take out this territory and completely mess you up. So you want to push a little bit further beyond your territories and hold on to a little bit extra so that you don't lose that. So in fact, the debate should be, perhaps I should increase some of these numbers a little bit more or reduce this instead of five, reduce it down to three can be omitted. So that's that's the question there. Now, lastly, we have gain a prestige star if at the end of the game, Germany or a member of its alliance control all or most of the following territories, with the exception of five. All territory with the German printed around all, all Polish territory, all French home country, all territory on the continental Europe with the Spanish around all, Portugal, Gibraltar, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, Austria, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, all territory with a Greek or Czechoslovakian round all. So that extends things by quite a bit. So, 
Greek territory, boom, including Crete. You know what? I should do a different color. Let's do uh, this one. There's Crete. There's these ones. I did mention Yugoslavia, I know that. Romania, Bulgaria is probably going to be part of it as well. Yeah, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. So you're going to see something over here. You're going to see a lot of control. Czechoslovakia and Slovakia over there. You're going to see all of France. All of everything down here. And everything up here as well. As well as Poland. But not the Baltic states. Not the Baltic states over here. And not any Russian territory. So you see it's almost a shift from the previous one. Instead of focus here on the east and, and taking the taking the bulk of the eastern territories from the Russian or Western Russian territory. Instead you're going east and taking much of continental Europe. That's the idea. So we have two different options for tier 4 victories. So you're not forced one way or forced the other way. That's the scoop. And of course the exception is 5. So if you give these two territories to the Russians... East Poland and Lubelski. If you even give Romania, you still have a little bit of wiggle room so you don't have to take out Crete and you might not have to take out Gibraltar. And so at that point, you do have a little bit of wiggle room where you're still safe with that's five. So you have to take out everything else. So yeah, you get the scoop behind that. That's the design for the great German Europe or Großdeutschland Europa. That's the idea there. That's my thoughts on the German prestige award system. And uh, you could score one thing from each tier. So up here, probably the most classic would be the Happy Time. Next up would be Oper well, Operation Fire Magic. This one's going to be difficult because nothing's clearly non-history. But I think almost every single game I've seen where Germany's gone after Russia, most games they've managed to take out Leningrad. So that's why it's up here. Uh, tier 3 is much more difficult. And uh, it really depends at that point how well the Allies are doing. They can keep the Germans out of Stalingrad, but only if the Allies are really present and really launching their invasions, really putting a lot of pressure. It's it's uh, and, and also the Russians too, if they play their cards right, they can also throw them off. So a classic game would see maybe a tier two for the Germans. Possibly a tier three, but not much more than, you know, definitely not a tier four. So that's the idea there. Now, give me your constructive feedback. Is this designed well? Is this designed right? What would you change? What do you think of the numbers I put in here for the territories? I, I think looking into this, I should probably add Denmark in here as well. Um, but apart from that, I'm pretty content with how things look. So let me know your feedback, and I appreciate your thoughts on the subject. That is it, people. Thank you all for watching. Cheers.